Now, fire, one of the most fascinating, for some the most fascinating element of nature, the source of light, the source of life, and the ultimate, the most impressive destroyer of all forms of life, seems to have been a crucial element in most religious practices, both in the Aegean and beyond. Although there is no specific evidence for the existence of fire worship in modern Crete and the ancient Greek world in general, fire played an important role in numerous ancient and modern, modern day religions. In the ancient Greek world, centuries after the collapse of the Minoan and Mycenaean civilizations, fire is the ultimate medium for the purification, the ultimate redemption of body and soul. In ancient Greek law, we all remember Achilles, the Morphon, and Heracles. Fire purifies and leads to immortality, a reference to its ultimate healing properties. In ancient Greek fire festivals, usually associated with the worship of gods like Hera, Artemis, and Demeter, and demigods like Heracles. Live animals, or parts of sacrificed animals, offerings brought, bought by common people, and even xoana, statues of the gods, were thrown into the ritual pyres, lit in towns and sacred locations in the countryside, including mountaintops like the pile lit on top of Mount Kitheron and the pile of Heracles on Mount Eti. Now, the connection between the ritual use of fire in the historical period and the prehistoric Aegean was made quite early by Nicolaus Platon, who suggested that, quote, the survival of the ritual uh, of pyres at the top of mountains and the Holocaust performed there during ancient Greek times originate or closely associated with pre-Greek Crete. Now, in the modern Greek world, pious had, and still have, a special role in customs that are often peripheral to official religion. Pious in towns and mountaintops are mostly associated with physical and moral purification with health and healing, with the aversion of evil, with the fertility of the earth, the fertility of people and animals, communication with the divine, and the passing from one cycle of nature to another. The activities accompanying these fires include mostly communal, usually circular dances, jumping over the fire, or treading on the burning embers of the pyre, throwing of objects or offerings into the flames, and animal sacrifice. In the festival, in honor of Constantine the Great and his mother Eleni on the 21st of May, the treading of the fire by the Anastenarides in Macedonia involves music, participants in a trance, of course, and the sacrifice of an animal, usually a sheep. The treading of the fire by the initiates involves notions of purification, mostly moral purification from injustice, regeneration, and above all, communication with the gods. The ritual fires lit on mountaintops during the festival of Prophetess Elias in July, and in the fires lit for the feast of Ayanis on the 24th of June during the summer solstice. Ancient rites concerning the changing of the seasons and the purifying, healing and apotropaic power of fire have survived in Christian times and include circular dances, jumping over the flames, and as a last gesture, wreaths of flowers being thrown into the living flames. One of the most popular and most disputed theories as regards the ritual practices in modern peak sanctuaries 
concerns the existence and the importance of ritual pyres. It has been suggested that these pyres represented the conclusion of elaborate rituals, during which various offerings were thrown by the worshippers in the fire, mostly pottery, figurines, and parts of sacrificed animals. The deposits containing ashes, animal bones, and votives located in natural hollows or rock crevices in peak sanctuary sites have been interpreted as the result of the periodical ritual clearance of the sacred area after the completion of these rites. Despite the scarcity of published archaeological evidence in mostly looted peak sanctuaries, an entire corpus of scholarly theory has developed during the past century or so on the subject of ritual pyres, which has actually dominated modern research. In view of the rather negative evidence from the excavations at Atipades in Crete and Agios Iorios to Vuno and Kithira, the only unlooted peak sanctuaries to date, a detailed revaluation of the whole issue has now become absolutely essential. Now, the theory promoting the existence of extensive ritual pious in Manon Peak sanctuaries, which was initially put forward by J.L. Myers, calling them bonfires, based on the evidence from the excavation at Petsofas, and by Nikolaus Platon in the first synthetic study of the then known peak sanctuaries, soon enjoyed widespread acceptance. The finds from the Yuktas Peak Sanctuary in the 1970s, more than 25 years later, reinforced scholarly opinion about the validity of the old theory and the fixed nature of ritual practices in peak sanctuaries in general. The theory was then warmly embraced by Rutkowski, who also initiated the term the canonical peak sanctuary. Despite the general consensus in favor of ritual pyres, there have been certain scholars who thought otherwise. Pitfield, who initially defended the theory about the existence of large ritual pyres, and who went as far as to suggest a network of sacred pyres built on the same night over the entire island, the existence of extensive ash layers in all the peak sanctuaries and the existence of a single uniform cult pattern in all the Manern peak sites gradually recants on account of the incontrovertible archaeological evidence from his own excavation at the sanctuary in Atsipades. Having admitted the almost complete absence of layers with carbonized matter and animal bones at the site, he goes on to dispute the published data for ash layers as untrustworthy and lacking in scholarly proof, concluding that the archaeological evidence concerning smaller sanctuaries of the old palace period is in reality dubious and altogether, or altogether, sorry, non-existent. Other scholars such as B.C. Dietrich and Karl Novicki uh, have always doubted the paucity and uniformity of the ritual and have even questioned the documentation put forward by J.L. Myers and Nicolas Platon. Both Novicki and Watrous expressed a disagreement with Pitfield's earlier view about the homogeneity of the peak sanctuary cult, while Nano Marinatos disputed his theory about a single network of ritual pyres. Finally, Jones, in his synthetic study of peak sanctuaries and caves, while acknowledging the evidence concerning the existence of burnt material from fires in more than half of the peak sanctuary sites in Crete, he also points out that the data for the existence of pyres is not particularly numerous and that the frequency of the custom is in reality unknown. Now, the primary considerations concerning ritual pies in my own big sanctuaries should actually address three essential is issues. Firstly, the very existence of pies. Secondly, their frequency. And thirdly, the diachronic nature of the practice. 
The activities accompanying the suggested pyres, whether it's throwing of objects, uh, preparation of food, communal meals, um, social activities like dancing, singing, jumping over the fire and so on, should throw light on the ultimate raison d'etre of the practice. That is, whether they answered mostly symbolic, ritual actions, or they represented more practical needs, like protection from the elements and attempts to make the site more visible from afar, especially at night. Now, the archaeological remains, uh, directly, I would say intimately, associated with the existence and or popularity of ritual pyres, includes, firstly, the ex include, sorry, firstly, the existence of built structures, hearths, altars with evidence of burning. Secondly, the existence of ash, ashes or ash layers containing burnt organic material. Thirdly, traces of burning on objects and other organic remains like pottery, bones, um, seashells, etc. And lastly, pictorial material depicting pies in a peak sanctuary context. Evidence for the existence of pyres, be it remains of built structures or specific areas with burnt soil marking the location of the pyre or the fire in both palatial periods, have been ascertained in only five out of the 26 acknowledged peak sanctuaries. That is less than 20% of the sites, including the four largest and most important, I would say, sanctuaries in Crete, like Yuktas, Kofinas, Petsofas, and Traustalos. Truth be said, built structures, altars, are rarely attested in the extant peak sanctuaries, the only exceptions being the built stepped altar at Yuktas, the possible altar or offering table at Gonyes Malavisiu, probably Petro, partly stone paved at the center of the site, and three other cases of Petro structures at Vresinas, where Rutkowski mentions part of a stone altar which has survived to a height of 30 centimeters, Prignasitias, and Pyrgos Malavisiu at Pera Corfi. In the case of Prignas, Rutkowski describes the situation on the main terrace of the sanctuary as follows. It is thought that between the crack and the northern group of rocks, an altar must have stood near a rock that was partly damaged when the modern datum was being built. In the center of terrace one stands a rock measuring 80 centimeters by one and a half meter and about one and a half meter high, which according to the Varas, might have been used as an altar. The Varas noted that a funnel had been made in it for carrying away the blood of the sacrificed animals. Judging from the position of this rock, we may take it that this was the most sacred rock in the cult area. In the case of Peracorfi, again Rudkowski reports that near the cult building is a stone in which a rectangle has been hollowed out it may have been a sacrificial table put into secondary use. One half of a pair of lampstone horns of, con of horns of consecration was found near the building and may have come from an altar erected before the building on Terrace One. In none of the cases mentioned is there any, any reference to traces of burning on the constructions involved even if they were really used as altars. Finally, the black burnt earth and the ashes in which a large number of pottery vessels and votives and animal bones um, were found in the vicinity of the altar at Yuchtas belong, according to the excavator, to the old palace period, the so-called ash altar. Extensive areas with burnt soil marking the location of the pyre or pyres were apparently identified at Yuchtas, at Petsofas, at Kofinas, while at Traostalos, multiple 
Pile locations were apparently scattered both on the plateau at the top and in a series of niches of the bedrock at the foot of the slope east of the plateau. As regards Ayus Georgius de Vunon, the archaeological evidence for pyres or fires, ritual or not, is extremely thin on the ground and often ambiguous in character. Traces of pyres have been identified in only two locations, both on Terrace 2 at the top of the mountain, the most important and most easily accessible terrace in the sanctuary. Only one of the two locations preserves any credible evidence for the existence of a pyre dated to the Manon period. You can see the little flames between the two churches at the top. That is location. It involves a layer 35 to 38 centimeters thick in the north part of the area, in the south part, sorry, of the area between the two churches, with sporadic traces of burning. Now, I would like to emphasize here that these, this layer, this deposit, was not on the bedrock. It was above the bedrock, with the layers below it. Despite the undoubtedly manure, neopalatial character of the deposit, the accompanying pottery does not include a single conical cup, a single brazier, a single shirt with traces of burning. The fragmentary pottery material associated with the pyre has yielded an impressively small number of tripod cooking pots, none of which bore any evidence of having been actually used in connection with a burning fire, like 98% of the tripod cooking pots, in fact, at the site. <laughs> and an interesting array of cups, mostly semi-globular. The latter include two specimens of the shallow semi-globular version with a short inverted rim, which seems to have closer affinities with the Ayo Stephanos material dated in the MM3B early LMA1 period. Outside Kithira, similar cups at Knossos and Palekastro are dated again in the transitional, transitional MM3B, LM1A, and in the LM1A, LM1B periods. Another specimen, exemplifying a simpler version of the semiglobular with an incurving rim, is also at home in the LM1, LM1B idiom. Similar cups attested at Castri and Crete are dated to the MM3B and the LM1 periods. The same deposit also yielded a fragment of a deep, semiglobular, almost cylindrical cup with a flaring rim, which belongs to a group without close typological parallels, but with, with close affinities to the typology of the LM1 style. Finally, another specimen belongs to a small group of sherds within and out decoration, typical of Kithirian LM1B. The decoration consists of a sea anemone, part of an apparently marine style composition, perfectly in tune with the LM1B idiom on the island. The same applies to an open vessel discovered in the same location, also decorated with a marine style composition, a coral probably. The pottery material from the pyre also includes a single straight-sided cup with a flaring rim, almost cylindrical walls, an LM1 dark and light decoration that can be also assigned to the LM1, perhaps LM1B period. Uh, here you see the only close, ah, remotely close parallels from Castri uh, tumblers, unpainted, um, from the tombs. And a semi-globular miniature footed cup with a relatively well-preserved floral composition depicting two lilies, a plain version of the lily with two volutes and two stamens and possibly part of a third in a splaying arrangement. Now, the particular, this particular type of composition, although rare at Kithira, is also attested on the miniature conical right tone from the sanctuary and is safely dated to the LM1B period. Finally, the same deposit has yielded two fragmentary writa, a miniature conical writone and a miniature cup writone of the footed kind, 
both decorated with floral compositions, dense, oblique compositions of branches with leaves, perfectly consistent not only with the LM1B ceramic tradition at Kithira, but also with LM1B floral compositions from the Menelion in Laconia, Agia Irini on Kea, and Palekastro in Crete. In the second pie location now, again on Terrace 2, in the east part of the site, in the area south of the south wall of the Agios Iorios Church, the possible remains of a pyre associated with architectural remains of a post manoan post-Mycenaean period, and a large number of post manoan post-Mycenaean pottery. Although the area featuring the remains of the pyre below a later stone paved floor contains mostly later pottery, the disturbance was only identified in this one specific location. The rest of the deposit was nevertheless almost exclusively Manoan in character, and I should say at this point that in contrast to the previous pie location, the pottery was here both protopalatial and neopalatial. The pottery associated with the deposit included, apart from a relatively modest number of tripod cooking pots, again with no trace of burning, etc., etc., six fragmentary braziers, two of which preserve distinct traces of burning on the interior. The closest parallels attested at Agia Irini on Kea are dated almost exclusively to the LM1 period. The same deposit also included six straight-sided cups, equally divided between the protopalatial and the neopalatial era. One of the protopalatial specimens, though, is an exceptional piece, with intriguing plastic decoration against the exterior of the rim, almost identical to a similar type of cup discovered at Anemospilla in Crete, against the south wall of the East Room and dated to the MM2B, MM3A period. Two other specimens are apparently also cited from Trulos and Poros, respectively. Similar examples in Fayans are recorded in the temple repositories uh, at Knossos and in Grave Circle B at Mycenae. Other exceptional um, specimens include a fragmentary conical right turn which, despite the lack of exact parallels, I believe can be safely placed in the LM1B tradition. A fragmentary miniature cup right tone, a footed cup of LM1B date. And here on the right you see uh, examples from Magia Irini, parallels Magia Irini on care. A fragmentary miniature tripod vessel and four fragmentary vessels with plastic marine decoration. Three of these specimens seem to belong to the same vase, preserving admittedly small parts of a presumably larger marine composition. The applique cockle shell in one of the three specimens represents the most popular type of shell in the Mana and repertory, attested throughout the MM and the LM1 periods. The two remaining specimens preserve parts of the tail and the body of naturalistically rendered appliques representing fish, rather similar to the faience flying fish in the temple repositories at Knossos. Judging by the size of the preserved examples, it seems that they might have been part of a relief scene on a vase or utensil similar to that on the well-known specimen from Festos. Although the close association, I should say here that I do know how well established is the close association between marine style and cult, at least in Mana and Creed. Uh, but I believe that the importance of this relationship in the religious context of the peak sanctuary at Kithira is rather weak due to the small number of extant specimens with marine decoration. Now, the last specimen, the fourth one, Decorated with a, with a snail in relief, probably part of a small, possibly miniature open vessel, was made of red mica ware and preserved strong traces of burning on both faces, an indication that the vase had been probably thrown into a fire. 
In the same deposit were also recorded 19 intact conical cups, uh, five of them protopalatial that you see here, but mostly neopalatial in date. One juglet with floral decoration of LM1 date, nine fragmentary monochrome carinated cups, all perfectly at home in the MM1B, MM2A period, three fragmentary semi-globular basins, three calathi of LM1 date, six discs or plates, a fragment of a sieve or incense burner with polychrome decoration of the MM1B, MM3 period, and a variety of mostly large storage vessels of and the neopalatial era. The recorded instances now of burnt material from pyres in hollows and rock crevices are more numerous, or I don't know, they're more frequently mentioned by the excavators of peak sanctuaries. Deposits, deposits with ashes in hollows and crevices of the bedrock are attested, according to Jones, in 15 of the 26 acknowledged peak centuries. That is approximately 58, almost 60% of the acknowledged sites, including, I guess, Yorgos Tovuno and possibly the sanctuary at Keryama Levizium. At Atsipades, although the archaeological evidence does not support the existence of ritual pyres, the excavator does mention the existence of a small deposit with carbonized material in a niche of the bedrock in the upper terrace. At Agios Georgios Tovuno, burnt material from pyres, which includes scattered pieces of charcoal, burnt wood, ashes, and burnt material in general, is attested in 10 out of the 15 extant layers. This is a distribution maps of the layers with burnt material at the sanctuary. Mostly on terrace two, which is the top one, in this case where the churches are. In this case too, the association of the burnt material with the Manern Peak Sanctuary is often extremely tenuous on account of post manern disturbance. It is moreover interesting that the largest quantities of carbonized and burned matter, almost the entire quantity of burnt wood, and one of the two locations with traces of ashes, are attested in disturbed layers, where the majority of the pottery is dated in the post minoan and post mycenaean period. And of course, the connection with the Minoan peak sanctuary is extremely tenuous. In the exclusively Manern layers, that is about six out of the 15 layers, including the pyre, and in the layers with mostly Manern material, up to 20%, that is, which is four out of the 15 layers, the quantity of carbonized and burned matter ranges from small to minute. Unfortunately, only four of the layers with burned material from fires or pyres can be identified with areas which I called primary deposition areas of votive material. There are three from Terrace 2 and one from Terrace 4. A fact that probably weakens the alleged connection between the suggested ritual pyres and ritual depositions in rock crevices. Judging by the general distribution of the pottery material in these layers, it seems that there are no significant concentrations to speak of. The only types of vessels present in numbers that exceed 50% of their total population are miniature bird and bird's nest balls, vessels with through holes used as sieves or incense burners, miniature tripod vessels, discs or plates, and fruit stands. All quite rare shapes in the sanctuary and of a clearly symbolic ritual character. Braziers, lids, pithoid jars, and calathi form smaller, perhaps totally insignificant concentrations, ranging between 30 or 40% of the total population of each vessel type 
with the exception of the basins, all the remaining types of vessels, <laughs> and I'm talking about the conical cups, the straight-sided cups, the tripod cooking pots, the juglets, storage vessels, right, uh, uh, even vessels with plastic decoration. I'm talking about the most numerous and or significant vessel types, vessel groups in the sanctuary are attested in extremely low, occasionally indifferently low numbers, less than 20% of the total. Now, traces of burning on objects and organic matter is a familiar issue directly associated with the activities accompanying the suggested fires or pyres. It has, however, been almost impossible to test since the relevant data, mostly ignored in the published reports, are in reality very poor. Myers, the first to introduce the subject of ritual pyres and to suggest that votive offerings were actually thrown into these pyres does not mention anything about traces of burning on the extant votive offerings from pits of fires that you see here. Platon, who embraced Maya's theory, is however forced to admit the absence of, quote, obvious traces of burning, unquote, on the figurines. In an attempt to explain this phenomenon, he suggests that they were perhaps thrown when the pyre was being extinguished. This explanation was later also adopted by Rutkowski. We know very little about the state of most of the portable finds from Yuchtas. In a lecture about the clay animal figurines from Yuktas at the Danish Archaeological Institute ages ago in Athens, I think it was 98, Maria Zembeki, who had studied the animal figurines from the site, was negative as to the existence of traces of burning on the votives. The only sanctuaries which have yielded votive offerings with explicit traces of burning are Traostalos, and a new site, relatively new site, at Korakomuris Faka, where a large percentage of the material bears apparently clear traces of burning. At Agios Georgios to Vuno, none of the votive offerings of the Banan period preserve any traces of burning. This is also true of the finds in the single, verifiably Banan layer, preserving the remains of a pyre. None of the finds in this layer, the pottery material included, preserved any traces of fire. As far as the pottery is concerned, the percentage of specimens with traces of burning is really very small and does not exceed 0.15% of the total. It concerns 10 different vessel types, mostly tripod cooking pots, which I must say comprise 90% of the mater burnt material, and we should bear that in mind, conical cups, jugs or amphorae, and juglets, miniature juglets. The remaining types of vessels are represented by one or two specimens each. Judging by the types of vessels represented, it is worth noting that in the vast majority of the cases, that is 90%, 90% percent of the total, that is the tripod cooking pots, the braziers and the single incense, um, incense burner, the traces of burning could have been the result of primary use and were probably not caused by their being thrown or placed into a fire. The remaining specimens, that's only 30, represent a really small minority, under 10% of the pottery material traces of burning and 0.015% of the total of the pottery material at the site. Only in two cases, two miniature vessels, a miniature disc 
and a miniature bird's nest ball appear to have been actually placed on the fire as opposed to being thrown into the fire. Judging by the distribution of burn marks and by the intact state of one of the two examples. The vast majority of the remaining sherds, 28 out of the 30, had been burnt in places both inside and out, and it seems that they had been broken before they came into contact with fire. Their open drinking vessels, conical cups, closed storage vessels, as well as specialized vessels of possibly ritual use. It is worth noting that the majority of these vessels are made of red mica clay, the clay commonly used for vessels meant to come into contact with fire, like the tribal cooking pots, for example, and do not bear any traces of painted decoration. Of the two miniature vessels that had been possibly placed on the fire, only one, the disc, was discovered in a primary deposition area at the top of the mountain on Terrace 2. On the left, you see a distribution of um, primary deposition areas. On the right, the distribution of the layers with burnt material. So you can compare. In this layer were also found many bronze and clay votive offerings and many animal bones, but very few traces of burnt material. The vast majority of the remaining specimens, 26, um, which had probably come into contact with fire after they had been broken, was attested in primary deposition locations, especially on Terra 7, the lowest terrace, which have nevertheless yielded no traces of fire or burnt material or, uh, from fires whatsoever. Faunal remains, usually associated with carbonized organic material, are even less well documented. Um, according to Jones, animal bones are attested in only six of the 26 acknowledged peak sanctuaries. That's 23% again. Vrisinas, Yuktas, Gonies, Mazas, Traostalos, and Agios Giorgios, Tovuno. Only at Yuktas is the precise fine spot of the, anim and the anim of the animal bones and the animal species specified. The layer associated with the pyre near the altar yielded an apparently large quantity of animal bones, mostly sheep and goats, followed by pigs, bovids, and a few bird bones. The bones from sheep and goats seem to preserve butchery marks. Etraostalos, Although burnt animal bones are um, associated not only with the uh, ritual pyre at the top of the hill, but also with the smaller pyres all over the sanctuary, it is pointed out that the total number of bones is small and that they're therefore interpreted as remains of sacrifices. The systematic study of the animal bones from Magus Georgios to Vuno is the only of its kind, I'm afraid, as far as big sanctuaries go. According to Katerina Trandalidou, uh, who was responsible for the study of the faunal remains, the animal bones from the sanctuary are most probably remains of meals on account of the butchery marks on the bones. In the primary deposition areas, the vast majority of the bones, an average of 88%, belongs to sheep and goats, followed by pigs and bovids, while birds mostly partridges and pigeons, constitute only 1.95, less than 2%, let's say approximately 2% of the total. What is even more important, though, is that only 2.67% of the animal bones in the sanctuary were carbonized. Sorry that is thrown into a fire to burn completely, presumably as votive offerings. Somebody with uh, not so many, so much religious leanings and persuasions uh, might say that these bones would have entered there after a, a good meal to keep the site clean, as we often do today after a picnic, a barbecue, a feast. But um, who is to know? 
The exceptionally small number of peak sanctuaries which have yielded votive offerings or pottery with traces of burning, that's three out of, as you can see, of the 26, or evidence of carbonized animal bones, especially if they are compared to, but to the multitude of peak sanctuaries preserving evidence of burn deposits, suggest that the custom of ritual pyres should be finally disassociated from the throwing of objects, votives, pottery, or parts of animals into the fire. Finally, as far as the iconographic representation of pious is concerned, perhaps the most elusive criterion of all, the evidence is extremely limited. The only published evidence involves Shaw's interpretation of the central altar on the Zakros Ritone, the upper level of which is said to represent fuel, that is wood, for the lighting of a fire, alluding to the existence of a real pyre in an open air sanctuary. The almost total absence of iconographic representations of the ritual use of fire in Manonat in general might nevertheless be misleading. Considering the archaeological evidence in a considerable number of peak sanctuaries, for example, and should be perhaps attributed to the selectiveness in the iconography of the prehistoric Aegean, and perhaps, in my opinion, to the ineffectiveness of iconography as a media for interpreting prehistoric ritual practices in general. Now, concluding, I can say that despite the absence of iconographical evidence concerning the use of fire in Manon Peak sanctuaries, and despite the rarity of objects or votive offerings with traces of burning, the rest of the archaeological evidence confirms the existence of pyres or the use of fires, which is possibly different, in a considerable number of peak sanctuaries and more specifically in almost 60% of the sites. Judging by the extant data, the diachronic character of the custom, both during the protopalatial and during the neopalatial periods, is also indisputable. The frequency of the custom cannot be ascertained in every case, except perhaps in sanctuaries such as Yuchtas, Petsofas, and Traostalos, where the thickness of the deposits or the, um, the number of the extant pyres, sorry, must have done something here, yes. The number of the extant pyres allude to its frequency. It is on the whole very likely, in my opinion, that there was considerable differentiation as regards the popularity of the custom, even among the sanctuaries where the existence of a pyre has been ascertained. What does seem certain is that the use of pyres was not a general practice part of a homogeneous cult ritual practiced in all the Manan peak sanctuaries, as was suggested for many years by many scholars. Now, the practice of throwing objects into the fire is another matter. It seems that there are only two sides, Traostalus and Korakomuris Fakas, which have yielded a meaningful number of objects or traces of burning, as was explicitly stated in the published reports thus confirming the practice, but confirming the practice there. At Agios Georgios Tofuno, on the other hand, traces of burning have not been attested on any other type of votive of offering or object, except pottery. Even in this case, the traces of burning on the vast majority of the material, on 91% of the material, allude to the preparation and or consumption of food and the ritual or symbolic transportation of coals or ashes, I'm referring to the braziers, which were so small, miniature basically, that rendering the whole practice symbolic. As the main causes of the burning marks, which can be traced back to the primary use of the vessels. Of the remaining 9% of the material, only two specimens, both miniature, have been, had been probably placed on a pyre and could therefore be considered as part of a symbolic ritual act. If therefore, the ritual disposal of pottery and parts of sacrificed animals was a sporadic practice on Manon Peak centuries and basically disassociated from ritual pyres, 
And if evidence of elab for elaborate food preparations is lacking from most peak century sites, the activities accompanying the extant pyres, obviously involved, human actions untraceable in the archaeological record. And that, of course, would be ritual dances, leaping, uh, throwing flowers, and even a combination of two or all of them. We should always be mindful of the multidimensional, <laughs> the multifarious nature of the fire, and of the fact that in the Greek world, purification of the body and the soul, and the healing and fertility of both animate and inanimate creatures does not define, does not determine the nature of the activity accompanying the pyre rituals. Finally, we should not forget that human beings, both then and now, find solace in the warmth and safety of the fire, especially at night. Stay up and dance around pyres, leap over the flames, tread on the embers of the fire, and occasionally throw objects in the dying flames, successfully defying time, logic, gods, and religions. Thank you. <laughs>